All right, you're still muted. Okay. Um, just a couple of announcements to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our second virtual Science on Tap. I hope you have something good to uh, drink and eat and you're someplace comfortable so you can join us for this uh, great evening talk. Um, a couple of logistics and some announcements before we get started. Um, this is a webinar format, so that means you do not have a mic or any camera, but we would love for you to interact with us. So if you have any questions, please use the chat box at the bottom. That's a single little call out. Um, and if you click on that, you'll get a pop out and you're able to um, put in any questions into that box. Feel free to put them in at any time, but we'll probably answer most of them at the end of tonight's presentation. Um, wanted to also let you know that we are recording this um, event. And so um, it'll be posted on the Hatfields post seminar page, um, probably in a couple days. Um, so if somebody you know wanted to join but was unable, um, they'll be able to watch the recording of this um, in a couple of days. I also wanted to make a little plug for our next Virtual Science on Tap, which will be July 22nd, also at 6 p.m. Uh, Sheena Steingast, the Marine Mammal Program Leader for ODFNW, will be talking about science on ice, humans, walrus, and the health of communities in a changing Arctic. So that is going to be also a really amazing talk. Um, if you need the link to any of our upcoming events, you can go onto HMSC's homepage, scroll to the bottom, and get to the calendar, and all the links will be there. But what we really want to find out about is a little bit more about Angie, so Angie can take us on her walk with us. Um, so let me just do a quick introduction. Uh, Angie is the Marine Fisheries Specialist with Oregon Sea Grant and Oregon State University Extension here in Newport, Oregon. She works closely with community partners, including commercial fishermen, manager, and researchers to advance the understanding of fisheries in Oregon and along the West Coast. And she enjoys giving and providing community outreach and education like tonight's event. So uh, we are all welcoming you. Thank you very much, Angie. And I'm gonna let you take it away. Make sure you unmute yourself. You can't mute, unmute yourself. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Perfect. Oh, no. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a fun technical glitch. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and take us on a walk. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, as mentioned, I am Angie Dorr with uh, OSU and Oregon Sea Grant. And I really wish I could be doing this in person, um, preferably at the docks themselves, or if not, at least at Rogue Brewery. But I hope that you guys are all somewhere comfortable. You have the beverage of your choice with you. And I'm going to go ahead and take you on a virtual walk of the docks. So because I am an educator by training, I am going to start with giving you some facts and figures, um, but I will keep it brief and then we will get into the fun stuff. So as most of you probably know, commercial fishing is at the heart and soul of Oregon. Uh, it's a huge part of Oregon's culture, of our communities, and our economy. There are approximately a thousand commercial fishing boats here in Oregon, and overall, it commercial fishing contributes to about 10% of coastal economies. Obviously, that's not a uniform figure. There are certain areas along the coast where commercial fishing is the majority of the coastal economy, and other locations where it doesn't really play much of a role at all. But overall, on average, Commercial fishing contributes about 10% to the coastal economy here in Oregon. In 2017, commercial fishing was more than $540 million in economic contributions for the state of Oregon. And when we say economic contributions, that means more than just the uh, X vessel price that you get for landing fish. So more than just the selling of fish, that's also all of the industry that commercial fishing supports. If we didn't have commercial fishing, we wouldn't have um, you know, gear shops, we wouldn't have marine supply stores, uh, a lot of our famous or, uh, seafood restaurants wouldn't be in business. And so there's a lot of, say, additional um, industry that gets supported by commercial fishing. Uh, along with that, 540 million was about $10,000, uh, sorry, 10,000 jobs in 2017. Um, and I want to point out that our fisheries here in Oregon are extremely complex. That's true everywhere in the United States, but it's certainly true here in Oregon. Uh, there are layers of regulations. Uh, some fisheries are managed at the state, state level, some are managed at the federal level, and some are managed uh, via international agreements. 
So our commercial fishermen have to be extremely well educated in, uh, in order to do their job. I'm not going to spend very much time at all tonight talk about, talking about recreational fishing, but I did want to mention uh, that recreational fishing is also very important in Oregon, and I'm sure many of you have been out uh, fishing yourselves. Uh, in 2017, which is the last year we have good solid numbers for, recreational fishing uh, generated about $54 million in economic contributions, you know, through um, buying supplies, buying licenses, things like that, going on fishing trips. There were 1.1 million angler trips in 2017. And unlike commercial fishing, recreational fishing is luckily all managed at the state level. We have a couple really big fishing ports here in Oregon, as I mentioned, um, as well as a lot of smaller ones. Uh, but the, the really big ones are Astoria up on the north, uh, on our north coast, Newport right here on central coast, which is where I'm located, uh, Charleston and Brookings down on the south coast. And in terms of total landings in Oregon, uh, Astoria really kind of takes, takes it away each year. Uh, in, in 2019, they were responsible for about 53% of total landings for more than 177 million pounds of fish. Uh, Newport is always uh, in second place on total landings. And in 2019, we had about 123 million pounds. But it's a different story when you look at revenue. And I'll explain why in just a minute. But when you look at revenue, uh, Newport typically takes the lead. And in 2019, that's exactly what we saw with Newport itself uh, providing about 36% of total revenue from commercial fishing with about $58 million. Uh, and that's just X vessel price. So essentially that's just the price that um, we see from fishermen selling the fish that they're catching. That's not any of the additional industry or um, secondary effects. So our primary commercial species here, uh, well, one of the most famous ones in Oregon and one of the dominant species here in Newport is Oregon Dungeness crab. Uh, we also have a lot of fishermen that are going after Oregon pink shrimp. We have an entire complex of species uh, known as groundfish, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes. And of course we have albacore tuna and, and, we, um, and we have salmon, which I'll mention. So here in Newport, and this is just for Newport because that's what we're talking about tonight, uh, we have um, our, the dominant species that we catch here in Newport is groundfish. So in terms of total landings in 2019, we caught about 100 million pounds of ground, groundfish that was landed here in Newport, um, resulting in about $18 million of revenue. But as you'll notice, if you look at this pie chart, the big moneymaker here in Newport and in most of Oregon is in fact Dungeness crab. So even though we caught about 7 million pounds of Dungeness crab, that brought in $25 million uh, to Newport in 2019. Uh, pink shrimp, also very important with about 9 million pounds landed and $7 million in revenue. And of course, albacore tuna with 3 million pounds landed and 5 million pounds revenue. And of course, salmon, which is a much smaller percentage of the catch with just 228,000 pounds landed, um, but is a very important species economically and uh, culturally here in Oregon. So now what you guys have all been waiting for and why you guys all tuned in, and of course, thank you for tuning in, I am going to take you <coughs> on a virtual walk um, along the port dock. Now, in a perfect world, I would be doing this in person and leading you guys on a tour. In a slightly less perfect world, I would be live streaming it. But unfortunately, I do not have a camera crew, nor do I have fancy video uh, equipment. So I'm doing the next best thing, which is I'll lead you through a series of videos. So over the course of these videos, you'll get a bit of a feel for what an actual walk down the dock might look like. I will say I um, recorded these at different times, and so you might see slightly different vessels. Uh, I was hoping to go down and get some current video footage over the last week or two, but with everything going on in Newport in regards to the COVID-19 outbreak, I figured that the fishermen probably didn't need to have a strange person wandering the docks, uh, taking video and talking to themselves. So luckily I had plenty of footage from previous trips down there. And away we go their business here. We have a variety of commercial fishing vessels at Port Dock 5, including albacore tuna vessels, pink shrimp, hagfish, groundfish, 
Pacific whiting, occasionally market squid, and of course, our Oregon Dungeness crab vessels. We'll go on a quick walk around the port and we'll show you what some of these vessels look like up close. Walking down the docks, there's always a lot of trip hazards. Ropes will be tied up all over the place, boats will be plugged in. Oftentimes you'll see water coming out of the sides of the boats as they empty ballast or holding tanks. You can hear the sea lions in the distance. So we have a lot of different types of vessels and we'll go through all of them uh, as we make our way around the docks. Um, but obviously one of the most common um, and most popular are our crab vessels. I wanna point out that most of the vessels that do crabbing here in Newport are not dedicated to crabbing. In other words, they do multiple species throughout the course of the year, um, but crabbing is one of the most popular ones. We do have a few vessels that focus solely on crabbing. Um, but you can generally tell that a vessel is going out crabbing if their deck is generally clear or if it has crab pots. And if they have their um, live tank uh, facility set up on, on uh, the deck of the boat. And then always any boat that is equipped to go crabbing will have a crab block, which is what they use to actually bring the crab pots up in order to check for crabs, <clears throat> excuse me, check for crabs, sort them and keep the ones they're allowed to keep. Uh, our crabs are managed extremely well here in Oregon. Um, they're managed basically through the, the three S's. So the first S is size. The crabs have to be a certain size um, in order to be, in order for commercial fishermen to keep them. Uh, the other S is sex. We can only keep the males. So if they pull up any females, they have to throw them back into the water and through season. So uh, we have a, a dedicated crab season and um, no commercial crabbers can go out outside of those, uh, that, those months. So all of our crab pots uh, look very similar, although you'll notice if you ever get a chance to go and walk around that all of the crab, um, all, the, all the crab gear will have different buoys. So here in Oregon, all of our uh, commercial crabbers have uniquely colored buoys. The crab pots in Oregon also have to be kept closed with a natural fiber uh, twine, something like that, so that if for any reason the crab pot gets separated from the line and can't be retrieved, it doesn't become what's known as ghost gear or ghost trap. In other words, it can't keep trapping crabs if, it's, uh, if it can't be retrieved. The closure that's being held close to that twine will degrade pretty rapidly, allowing crabs to exit the trap. So I have a quick video of crabs actually in a trap. And as you can see, there's uh, quite a bit of room in there. They move about around and they can catch quite a few uh, crabs with their traps. Yeah. Okay. that. That hand coiling, that's yeah. pretty special. He's yeah. good at that. Anyway. <laughs> that was so that was just a demonstration that some fishermen did for us to show us how the crab block works and how they can retrieve the crab pots. And I want to point out that they were doing that in slow motion. Um, when they're actually out on the water, they are moving much more quickly. The boat's moving more quickly, they're moving more quickly, and they are trying to remove multiple crabs, not just uh, one, I think might've been something that they had planted in there earlier, but regardless, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very rapid, um, high stress, high moving process. Oftentimes on much less calm water than we're seeing here in this bay. We also have a lot of trawlers here in Newport. Uh, specifically, we will see pink shrimp trawlers, ground fish trawlers, and then our midwater trawlers. And they all have a lot of similarities and some key differences. So our pink shrimp trawlers, uh, which you might see quite a few of out right now because it is pink shrimp season, are oftentimes double rigged. <laughs> what that means is that they will actually have a net on each side of the vessel. So the vessel has outriggers that will go out to the side and they'll drag a net on each side of the vessel. Um, the nets are held open with wooden doors, which you'll see in the upcoming video. Um, and uh, the wooden doors help to keep the net open. And then they have weights on the bottom and um, floats on the top to keep the, uh, the net open uh, vertically. 
and they are towed behind the vessel and used obviously to keep to to catch our Oregon pink shrimp. I will point out because I, I know that the fishing community will want me to. Um, you will sometimes hear Oregon pink shrimp referred to as bay shrimp. That is a different species. Uh, our Oregon pink shrimp is um, is actually a, an ocean shrimp, not a not a bay shrimp. So the Miss Yvonne here is actually set up for pink shrimp. The pink shrimp season opens in April. Um, and you can tell a pink shrimp vessel versus say um, ground fish or some other trawler because they have these wooden doors. See if I can get close without getting that post in the way. Now there's a lot of reasons that the vessels use the wooden doors. Originally, it was because uh, with a shrimp trawler, unlike a standard trawler, they put nets out on each side of the vessel using these right here. So that will drop down into the water and a net will come off the side and the wooden doors will go out and they will hold the net open. I'll explain this better um, when I'm not doing a video. Um, but because shrimp trawlers have two nets and because they're not large vessels, uh, they used wooden doors to reduce the weight. Um, oh, as opposed to that shrimp trawler over there, or sorry, market squid over there. Um, I'll, I'll head over there. But um, as opposed to say ground fish or something like that, who they're bringing one net, uh, they needed the, the doors to be lighter. And so they used wood. Nowadays, there's all sorts of composite metals and new things that they could use that would be probably lighter than wood that would work just as well. Um, but they've been using wood for so long, it's essentially a tradition. And if there's one thing fishermen are, it's a traditional. They like to stick with what works. And so you can always tell a shrimp trawler by these wooden doors. So something we can see really well on this, this vessel that we couldn't see on the last one um, is one of these shrimp nets. So as I mentioned, these vessels have shrimp nets on either side of the vessel um, while they were out actively fishing. And you can actually, if you look really closely, you can see the metal grate within the net. That is actually a bycatch exclusion device. It's designed to keep out essentially anything larger than a pink shrimp. Um, it does an excellent job. And between this and LED lights, which the fishermen also use, the shrimp fishery is almost entirely bycatch free. It's very sustainable. I was just gonna walk down Again, one of the offshoots on Port Dock 5. Talk about some of these vessels. So again, I think everyone knows what this is now, right? Pink shrimp, you can see the doors and you can see the net back there with that right catch exclusion device. We got the Majestic coming in right now. Looks like they might have been out long lining based on the baskets, but not sure they could have been out crabbing. And again, we have a lot of fish or a lot of uh, vessels right now that are setting up for multiple fisheries. Um, a lot of our vessels can do multiple things. So as you can see right now, they've got the wooden doors. They also have a reel in the back for ground fish. Um, right now, I'm guessing they're gonna be out catching pink shrimp. Um, and when they're, uh, the pink shrimp season's over, they are probably out catching ground fish. So we've got the Lady K as well. They are set up for pink shrimp. Again, pink shrimp fishery started in April. So a lot of pink shrimp vessels right now. And again, these vessels might be equipped differently at different times of year. Most of these vessels have different types of structures that can be taken in and out so that they have what they need when they need it. And I'm gonna come right over the edge of the water here so that I can show you this if I can zoom in. And you can see that metal grid I was talking about. And that's the um, shrimp hopper. That's where they put the shrimp when they catch it. Again, we got the wooden doors as well as the... Hello. Uh, so as you can imagine, I got quite a few inquiries as to why I was wandering around the uh, Port Dock 5 with a cell phone camera and muttering to myself. Um, so I had a quite a few uh, good conversations with the fishermen about what I was doing and they were all excited to hear uh, that I was going to be talking more about what they're doing um, and how the fisheries work. So I do want have a very quick video that I'm going to show you of one of those bycatch exclusion devices in action. And I will say that thanks to the 
um, those metal grids that help to reduce bycatch, as well as the use of LED lights, which also help to reduce bycatch. The Oregon pink shrimp fishery is a good 99% bycatch free. Um, it's the very first shrimp fishery in the entire world that was certified sustainable. That was about 10 years ago. And in fact, they just got recertified. So they are the longest running certified sustainable shrimp fishery in the world. So here you see some halibut, luckily not making their way into the, into the um, net. So another trawler uh, we have quite a few of here in Newport is of course, crownfish. Um, and I will say, because if I was doing this in person, you would hear me do it and you're gonna hear me do it on the video. Uh, I like to talk about the difference between groundfish trawlers or, or bottom trawlers um, and midwater trawlers. And um, oftentimes when I'm going back and forth and talking about both, I'll start referring to them as groundwater trawlers. So uh, listen for that, you'll hear it. Uh, some of the things I want to point out here is that um, unlike the pink shrimp trawlers, which oftentimes have two nets, our bottom trawlers have a single net. Um, in fact, the, if you can see my, my background here, is the Tani Ann. I took that here in Newport um, and it is a, uh, a bottom trawler. You can see that net in the back. Um, so the bottom trawlers often have a single net on the back on a smaller reel and then they have metal doors as opposed to those wooden doors. And the doors have come in all shapes and sizes but typically are smaller metal doors and not uncommonly are going to be um, almost an L shape. They'll be a, at an angle. And those metal doors act the same way as the wooden doors on the shrimp uh, vessel. You know, they help to hold that net open when it's being um, dragged through the water. As I mentioned earlier, groundfish is actually a number of different species. So uh, groundfish is over 90 different species. It's all managed collectively as a group. It includes more than 60 different species of rockfish, uh, includes a number of different flatfish, include Dover sole, English sole, um, it includes things like sablefish, also known as black cod, uh, ling cod, and um, Pacific whiting or hake, which makes up uh, a large percentage of, of our groundfish catch here in Oregon. Here we have the Western Breeze. It's a beautiful vessel. It does not have a net on board right now, but I'll take you around back so you can see. This boat's likely out crabbing right now or else it's just setting up uh, for groundwater trawling. And so when it is ready to go out and fish for a groundfish, um, have a giant net right there on that reel and they'll go out and catch um, all sorts of groundfish species. So rockfish, lean cod, sablefish, all sorts of species. So the Manny J right there is doing an excellent job modeling those, uh, the um, groundfish trawlers, those metal doors they have, they tend to have the smallest metal doors. The midwater trawlers have much larger metal doors and you can see the net on the reel. We have a boat coming towards me right now. I'm gonna back up a little bit. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll talk to you more about uh, groundwater trawlers, but I do wanna say I have, I see a question came in about the LED lights. So I'll take a step back real quick because I, this happens all the time on the walking tours. The LED lights work on the, um, for the shrimp trawlers because a fish, they put lights um, on, along the net and fish will actually respond to the lights and swim away and the shrimp will not. So the shrimp will continue to go into the nets um, and the, uh, um, the fish, not all of them, you still have a tiny amount of bycatch, but for the most part, the fish will actually swim away. And uh, if you went to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife webpage, they actually have some fun animation showing how that works. So back to uh, groundfish, um, I will say our groundfish, uh, the complex, if you will, the, all the species um, are extremely well managed as well. Uh, some of our fishermen would argue that they are over managed, um, which could be true. Um, they are one of the most heavily managed um, groups of uh, species groups, probably, probably in the US and not the world. Um, and because of that, they are also extremely healthy and extremely sustainable. Uh, so anytime you have an opportunity to get rockfish, you know, if you're getting fish and chips or fish tacos, by all means, go for it. 
Um, it's an excellent alternative to some other species you might see like tilapia or something like that. So I highly recommend rockfish. It's extremely well managed. Um, when our ground fish vessels go out, they are required to go out with a independent observer on board. Uh, so uh, that independent observer gets trained, goes out with the fishing crew. They're not actually one of the fish, uh, part of the fishing crew, but they're going out with them. And their job is to record everything that gets caught, everything that gets brought on that vessel, that observer is writing down. So we know exactly what's getting caught, when it's getting caught, how it's getting caught. Um, which is good. Uh, it also can make things very challenging for our ground fishery, ground fish fishery, um, because there are certain species of rockfish that they can catch a lot of and other species that they cannot catch very many of at all. And unfortunately, as one fisherman put it, when you're going out to catch rockfish, you know, they have all the latest and greatest technology. They have cameras. They're trying to figure out what they're catching. They're trying very hard to make sure they're only catching from certain areas where certain species are. Um, but when you have a camera underwater, everything kind of looks the same. And a lot of rockfish look exactly alike other than coloring. And so it's essentially like closing your eyes, putting your hand into a jar of M&Ms and being told that if you pull out a green M&M, you get to keep fishing. And if you pull out a red M&M, you're done for the season because we have different quotas for different species within that rockfish complex. And so if they have a bad day and they catch too much of a certain species, they could be done for the entire season. Um, and so they do everything within their ability to make sure that they're catching only what they're supposed to catch, when they're supposed to catch, catch them. Um, there's no actual season for most species within, for in, in terms of ground fish, in terms of rockfish, although there are some caveats for th things like Pacific whiting and hake. I will also mention that those independent observers um, have to get paid whether the fishermen have a good trip or a bad trip. So it is an extra expense uh, for all of our commercial fishermen when they go out at catching ground fish. The third type of trawler we have here in Newport are our midwater trawlers. And you can tell those at a distance from the groundwater because while they will also have a reel on the back, they have a huge metal structure called a gantry. And I'm gonna show you some of these in videos. Um, and that's because when they're going out, they're often going out for Pacific whiting um, and they are catching large schools of fish in, um, at a single time and bringing in massive amounts of fish in a single net. And so um, a large net, heavy load. And so they have this big metal structure and, and a really, um, really heavy duty hydraulic winches bringing that, that load on board. And that's, if you've ever seen a hake in its, in its full form, that's what one looks like right there. Here we have the last straw and it is actually looks like it is set up now as you'll notice uh this one has a much larger reel on the back for it's uh, a gantry is what that is on the back for its net um, and this that's because this is a midwater trawler and when the vessels are going out and fishing midwater um, they're usually catching Pacific whiting, also known as hake, and they catch massive, massive amounts of it at a, at a given time. Um, and so they need a really robust structure to hold that net, net and allow them to pull it back on board. They have a giant reel here, a lot of hydraulics involved to bring that net back on board. So I mentioned the doors on the shrimp, on the shrimp vessel versus, in this case, midwater trawl. And again, this is the last straw we just were talking about see how big that structure is. Um, they also have the metal doors and I should have pointed them out before um, and I did not. And this one is tucked inside. Sometimes you'll see them on the outside of the vessel and we'll find one, um, but that's one of those metal doors. So we'll find a vessel with the doors on the outside so you can get, get a better look at them. Here we can see the Miss Sue. That one is set up for midwater trawl. And again, uh, you can see those large metal doors. They need large metal doors because they have large nets and heavy loads. Um, and the midwater trawl vessels tend to be larger um, so they can, you know, better pull their heavy load behind them. So as we go through these videos, um, because I'm walking down Port Dock 5 and the kind of the offshoots on Port Dock 5, um, you'll see a lot of different types of vessels. Like here in this shot, uh, you can see um, in fact, you can see two market squid um, vessels, which I will talk about in a minute. Uh, but you can kind of look around while I'm walking and you'll see a number of different shrimp vessels, ground fish, um, uh, midwater. So the, uh, another 
important vessel here in Newport uh, is a very similar word, but very, very different type of fishing. So I just went over the tra trawlers and these are the trollers. Um, and so our primary trolling vessels are albacore, tuna, and salmon. And trolling is essentially hook and line. So with both of these, um, the fishermen are going out and they're catching salmon or tuna on individual hook and lines um, with J hooks, with barbless hooks, which means these are entirely bycatch free fisheries because the fishermen can selectively target uh, which fish they're going after, after and which fish they're pulling up. Um, and so uh, very, very well managed fisheries. Um, so there you go, there's salmon and um, I'll show you tuna and you'll see that they look extremely similar. One of the key differences is that with um, our salmon uh, fishery, uh, because we're going after Chinook here in Newport, we can't catch coho or any other salmon species. The primary commercial species of salmon here in Newport is Chinook, uh, also known as king salmon. It's the largest salmon species and it occurs at the um, uh, deepest in the ocean. And so in order to make sure that we are selectively targeting the, the species we're allowed to catch, which is Chinook, uh, the fishermen are fishing really, really deep in the water column. And so they have these massive lead weights, also known as cannonballs, that help the, to bring the line down to depth. My name is Paul Mers. I'm a commercial salmon fisherman. I've fished commercially since 1970. The boat that I've got now, that it's a salmon troller. Uh, we use a different kind of gear than pretty much any other fishery. We fish hook and line gear only, land one fish at a time, take care of one fish at a time, try to produce a good product. If you want, why we'll uh, go down and look at the boat, and look at the gear and show you how things work. When we're fishing, we usually fish between two and a half and three knots. These leads here go between 45 and 60 pounds a piece. As the wire goes down, we'll pull the gear out of the storage area, throw it off the back of the boat, and then it gets clipped on the wire with this snap as it goes out. And the snaps are spread and there's stops on the wire. We put four hooks on each wire. That's all we're allowed by law. This is a cleaning trough when the fish come aboard why, why after they're bled and stunned and we have to dress them. Uh, the fish is laid in here on its back, the gills are removed, the belly split, the guts are pulled out, and then it's on this boat, it gets power bled, which is done by cutting a throat latch around the gills. It allows the blood out of the fish. The heart continues to pump for a couple of minutes. And then after we let the fish bleed out, then we pressure bleed it with this, which removes all the blood out of the fish and gives you a longer shelf life. We have uh, pretty much all the amenities you have at home may not be as fancy, but uh, we live here. I, I go to sea for four days at a time. Experience tells you what to look for as far as currents, water conditions, what the fish are eating, how deep they are in the water column. Some people call it luck. Some people, I think there is some luck involved, but some experience pays off a lot of times too. So we have a, you'll see one more of these videos, but I will say we have a whole series of these on the, our Oregon Sea Grant webpage of these working waterfront videos, and they are phenomenal. And I highly recommend you check them out. And I had filmed some footage, um, but there are not a lot of boats set up for salmon and tuna right now. And so I elected to use the videos that we already had. Um, and they're really well done and I love watching them. So highly recommend there's a whole series of them, um, including some on pink shrimp, on um, seafood processors, so by all means, check them out uh, if you want more information. So as you'll notice, the tuna trawler looks uh, quite a bit like the salmon. Um, the, the main difference between these two trawlers is that with tuna, uh, here in Oregon, we're catching juvenile albacore. Um, and they tend to school at the surface, the ocean surface. And so we don't need any weights or anything like that to catch tuna. Um, in fact, you don't even need bait for the most part to catch tuna here in Oregon. We use what are called tuna jigs, which are essentially, um, if you ever come on one of my tours in person, I actually have one I can show you, but they're, they're essentially rubber squids is, is uh, 
I mean, what they're designed to look like and what they do look like. And so they put them in the water at, right at the surface and they drag them behind the vessel as they're, as they're sailing through the water. And um, the lures move around and it attracts the tuna right there at the surface. Um, and they catch them right there with the hook, uh, with the barbless hook. Um, every now and then they do catch something other than tuna, say a shark or something gets excited and grabs on. But because of the way the hooks are designed that they are required to use, they actually can get that, that other animal off the hook and uh, without even taking it out of the water, kind of letting it swim away um, and really selectively target just the salmon that they're going after or just the tuna that they're going after. Okay, let's see if I can make that work. As a tuna fisherman, uh, a freezer boat, we provision for 14 days at a time and hope that we're full before that. Full is uh, 10 to 12 tons. You generally were fishing between 100 and 200 miles offshore. Okay, this is my this is my brother's bunk. He uh, he fishes with me. So this is where he sleeps. This is this is how much room he has to sleep in. This piece of equipment here it is a depth sounder, radar, and back deck camera, so I can see what's going on on the back deck. This is a troller, T R O L L E R. Um, we use no nets. We use hooks. We lower fish to hope that they bite our hooks and we catch them one at a time by hook and line. We stand in here, which, which is what's called a trolling pit. And we haul the line over to us and we put it in the, the shiv and use the hydraulic system to pull the fish up to us within a couple of poles of line. We pull the fish, we put it on the boat, we immediately dispatch it, bleed it, um, let it uh, cool for a little bit uh, because it's hot when it comes in and we run water over it and then we put it in the brine tank. It's all full of equipment now, but normally it's full of, of uh, zero degree seawater. Uh, we are able to get it to zero degrees by putting extra salt in it, which lowers the freezing temperature of the water. When the fish come out of there, they're literally that hard. We take them and we put them down in the fish hold. That's where we hold the fish up to 12 tons of them until we're ready to come back home and deliver the fish to the processor. So now we get to one of my favorite sections. And unfortunately, uh, the way I set up this presentation, it's not zooming back out, but this section is called uh, squids and slime. Uh, and these are some of my favorite species to talk about. So something that you may have noticed, especially if you are a longtime resident of uh, Oregon, is that uh, over the last couple of summers, we've had a lot of market squid vessels in our ports. Um, and I will uh, kind of talk about this in the video, so I won't go into too much detail now, so you're not listening to me repeat myself. Um, but market squid is typically caught off the coast of California, and it's managed by the state of California um, rather than uh, the state of Oregon. Market squid is, I think, a beautiful animal, which is why I gave you guys a picture of it. Um, and it's uh, also a very, it's a very short-lived animal. They live less than a year. Um, you know, they essentially they're born, they grow up a little bit, they mate, they die, uh, and so. Um, if you, as long as you catch it after it's mated and before it, you know, it dies, you're doing well. And uh, it's essentially calamari. Anytime you're eating calamari, you're basically eating market squid. I have another angle, but I wanted to show you this market squid vessel. As you can see, it has uh, basically a skiff or a smaller goat behind it. And that's because market squid, um, they catch with large bursains. And so that vessel will actually take the net out and around and back to the vessel so that it's, uh, you know, deployed in a large circle so they can scoop up the market squid. Over here, here on the tempo, we had a boat that was set up for market squid. Market squid is not a standard organ fish. However, for the last several years, anytime uh, the waters turn warm, 
you get fishermen that come up here, oftentimes from California, down from Washington, or even a few of these, uh, these days that are actually just from Oregon locally, um, that will go for market squid. Because the squid that comes up here, comes up north when the water temperature is warm. And there's a lot of speculation, assumptions, hypotheses um, that with climate change, market squid will continue to move north and become a regular fixture in the Oregon fisheries. And so there's a lot of conversation going on right now about how to regulate the market squid fishery should it become a standard Oregon fishery. We got this friend right here. I didn't even see him, almost walked down there. So I, oh. <laughs> Once I walk down there so I can show you that vessel, but he is, uh, that's his, his right now, he says. Here we go. This one is set up for market squid. And you can see that, that smaller vessel I was talking about is right there on the boat. Underneath, there, underneath the tarp is going to be their large net. And so when they're going out for market squid, they'll put that into the water um, and it will drag the net out. One thing to note is a lot of these larger market squid vessels are from other locations. Um, and so as you can see, this one is from Alaska. A lot of them are from California, or Washington, very few Oregon market squid vessels um, or that are, that are solely market squid. We do have a couple that are catching market squid, um, but that's because many of these boats that I mentioned have parts and pieces that you can put on and take off. And so they've essentially just Angie, can you hear us? You've frozen and so has the video. If you can still hear us, you might need to log out and log back in. For those folks online, hang in there. We'll get her back. This would be a good time to enter any questions you might have um, in the chat box so that we're ready to go when she comes back and we can uh, ask her any questions you might have. Hang in there, everybody. Hoping to get her back. Oh, yay. Okay, let me see if I can get your voice back. So our power just went out and I apologize. <laughs> so one of those fun things about working from home, uh, our whole power went out in our house for a split second. So I'm sorry, we live in rural Glen Eden Beach and that is not uncommon and I didn't foresee it. I don't know why it went out, but it's back and I sincerely apologize. Um, we, we are good, Angie. So go ahead and uh, you want to try sharing your screen yeah. again. Share it again and we will get uh, back going and I so will skip the rest of the video um, and we will be back on track and I will move right on to hagfish. Apologies. Okay. Everyone. And for, I saw a question right before my power went out that I was going to answer. Um, and uh, that was about going to the docks in person. And yes, you can. And yes, I will talk more about that in a minute. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So um, last species I'm going to talk about before I talk about some of those things is one of my personal favorites. Um, and that is hagfish, also known as slime eel. Um, and so uh, hagfish is a very, very small fishery, but it is a, a, one that you will see regularly when anytime you come to visit Newport. Um, and some people know hagfish quite well in this area um, because in, I want to say July of 2017, we had a very unique experience that made national news 
when a person carrying hagfish, because it gets um, trans transported and, and exported live, they were carrying basically a tub of um, hagfish or slime meal down the 101, and something happened that caused that tub to fall off of the truck, and it landed on this Prius, um, and it completely slimed the Prius, it slimed 101, they had to get bulldozers out to remove the slime, because as you'll see in a video, um, it is really powerful stuff, and uh, Turns out this was a rental car, and I just love the idea of trying to turn this rental car in uh, and having to explain that situation. So. Hey there, uh, we have the Sea Wolf, which is equipped for hagfish, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, hagfish is one of my absolute favorite species to talk about. Hagfish are caught in these uh, barrel traps. They swim into these openings, which are essentially like ice cream cones, and then cannot swim back out. Hagfish have a number of really interesting defense mechanisms. They're fascinating species. Um, and one of the ones that they're most famous for is their ability to produce slime. As you'll see in this video, they use it to repel predators by releasing slime at the bite area, filling the mouth and gills of their predator. Yeah, you got to feel a little bit sorry for that shark. I was persuaded one of these guys to come and say hello, and actually, if you look, you can see along the side these tiny white holes. They look a bit like mouth ulcers, actually. And that's where it makes the slime to protect itself. And you can see now why we needed such a big tank. Apparently, just one of these fish can make enough slime to fill a bucket of water in seconds. So they, they produce a lot of this stuff just to make sure they don't get eaten by something else. I mean, it would put me off, to be fair. I'm not hungry. So with that in mind, I will say that we do export them because they are eaten, um, particularly in South Korea, where some of my South Korean friends tell me they're quite tasty. Um, I have not worked up the courage to try them myself, but at some point I think I'm going to have to just for professional uh, integrity, if nothing else. The slime itself is fascinating. Scientists are studying it. It's extremely strong. Um, you can stretch it forever, essentially, without it breaking. Um, the chemical composition of it is extremely unique. And because hagfish or slime eels are essentially living fossils, they have all sorts of uh, bodily structures and offense mechanisms and capabilities that we don't see in other organisms. So they're just really, really cool fish. Um, I will say that even if you're not in the mood for hagfish for dinner, their skin apparently makes excellent leather. So next time you're out uh, shopping for a new fashion item, you can get yourself a hagfish belt or a hagfish wallet, um, as well as a number of other products. And so if you're ever walking around the Newport docks, you can look for those, those barrels and uh, you'll know somebody's out catching hagfish. So we have a number of other commercial species. Um, I went through the major ones, but we do also catch halibut. Um, there are some people that do commercial clams or oysters, sharks and skates. Um, on occasion or in the, in the past at least, we did anchovies and sardines. And up in uh, northern Oregon, we do sturgeon as well. Um, you won't see it at Port Dock 5, but you might see it at some of the other ports here in Newport. Uh, so I will mention we also do aquaculture here in Newport, um, primarily uh, shellfish, uh, or sorry, invertebrates in general, invertebrate and seaweed. And so here in Newport, we have the Oregon Oyster Farm, which you can also visit. Um, there are people that are doing research on urchin aquaculture, as well as a number of people looking at dulse, which is a type of seaweed that in theory tastes like bacon. Um, I'll also quickly uh, mention the bayfront because it's an important part of any visit down to the commercial fishing docks. Yes, if I did not mention how important our local uh, commercial fishery is for the town of Newport. Um, so Newport is a tourist destination, but part of the attraction is the fact that it does have this working waterfront. So as you can see, literally right across the street, from the commercial port. We have local ocean seafood, um, which is a fantastic place to eat if you're ever down here. Uh, nice views, excellent food, and run by a Oregon State University alum. Um, and I will walk down a little bit more and 
show you guys one of our local seafood processors, as well as another place you can buy fish um, directly from local fishermen, essentially, that you can then take home and prepare on your own. So I will walk down a ways and then restart. So unfortunately, if I get any closer, you won't be able to hear me over the sea lions. Um, hopefully you can hear me over the wind. Uh, but that right there, that says fresh crab, that is the Chelsea Rose. It's run by a local fishing family. And there you can buy all sorts of species. Um, they buy, they get it from, it's a family of fishermen. Um, and so they catch a lot of their own fish. They also buy fish from the local fishermen and sell it direct there. They fillet it, they freeze it. Um, they have a processing plant these days as well, but you can buy local seafood direct, take it home, cook it up. And then Pacific Seafood is one of the um, large seafood processors, processors in the US. And we have a couple of different Pacific Seafood locations in Oregon. And we have one right here in downtown Newport um, and they process a variety of different species there. Okay, so the last thing I'll say um, and uh, I don't know, you know, if you feel like you got your, your feel, feel from this or if you're interested in more. Um, but part of my job, as I mentioned, is being an educator, being a liaison, doing outreach with community and with the public in regards to commercial fishing. Um, and along those lines, I do dock, walk, dock walks. It's one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, and I do them for, you know, organized groups. I do them for classes. I do them for summer camps. Um, you know, I do them for businesses that are, you know, trying to do something for team building or to get out in, into, into town. Um, but I'm, you know, happy to do them for any group, large or small. You know, if you have family coming to visit, if you just, you and some friends are curious about our commercial fishing docks, you're also more than welcome to um, walk on the docks themselves, yourself. They are, they are public. Um, I would say be careful. They are also... Um, working docks and the fishermen should always have the right of way. Um, there's a lot of trip hazards. Uh, you got to watch out for uh, the, the fishing vessel dogs, which sometimes, you know, are using the docks to relieve themselves and not being cleaned up after. So there, there are some hazards out there, but you are more than welcome to go down. Um, or if you have a small group or a large group and you would like a personalized tour, I'm happy to give you one. Um, I also lead shop at the dock, which happens over the summer. Um, and they are tours of the commercial fishing dock, um, along with some more in-depth notes about how to buy um, fish directly from the fishermen. Uh, I am not sure yet what Shop of the Dock is going to look like this year. It may be very small groups where we, you know, it's only, you know, groups of five and everyone wears a mask. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but I will keep you guys posted and hopefully we can make something happen. And that's it. That wraps up my tour. I'll stop sharing my screen in just a second, um, but my contact information is all there. And like I said, I'm a public employee. I work for OSU and Oregon Sea Grant. So I work for you guys. So anytime you need me, if you have any questions or concerns or just it's a nice day and you want to see the docs, you can call me up and we can see if we can make that happen. Great. Thank you so much, Angie. And thank you for uh, quickly coming back online. That was oh, a good move. Yes, sorry. <laughs> That was wonderful. We're getting really great questions, um, but one of the ones that I thought we would start with is if you could talk a little bit about how COVID has affected the fishing industry, um, just because you were kind of talking about that a little bit Absolutely. about how it's impacted you, um, but maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing just so you guys can see me better, um, and you can always reach out to me in chat if you want my contact information. Um, so yeah, COVID has absolutely affected the fishing industry for a number of reasons. Um, one, a lot of our, uh, a lot of the fishermen are, you know, on the older side, um, and so they're in a higher risk category, and you can't socially distance on a vessel. You just can't. You guys saw those videos from the, from the trollers, and of course, those are smaller vessels, but even on a slightly larger vessel, there's no way to socially distance on a fishing vessel. Um, and so you have to be in close proximity with someone. You're eating your meals together. You're sleeping in the same room for days at a time, uh, and so it's, it's really has been a concern. There's a lot of people that have been expressing concern um, in terms of health and safety. More so than any of that um, is the fact that we've lost a lot of our markets. And so there have been huge economic impacts to commercial fishermen. Uh, a lot of our seafood gets exported. Um, you know, some could argue that too much gets exported, but 
you can only argue that if you replace that with a local market. And it's very difficult given how much seafood gets exported to Asia, to Europe, um, to make that loss up locally, especially when we're also closing our hotels and closing our seafood restaurants. And so the commercial fishermen have really been feeling the impacts of this. Um, they've lost a lot of their markets. Um, they've lost, you know, uh, a, a lot of the market is live. Um, and they're now trying to figure out how to freeze things, how to store things. And so all sorts of production challenges and supply chain challenges and storage challenges. Um, so they're facing probably all if not more of the health and safety issues that the rest of us are, um, as well as huge economic impacts. All right, so we're getting, um, uh, how much does a commercial crab pot weigh? Oh. That's an excellent question. I lifted one up, but I am not, my husband, he's over here, he's my audience, which if you keep seeing me, it's because he keeps laughing at me. Um, <laughs> he's saying he's saying probably 30 pounds, but I don't know if that's accurate. If anyone is listening that's a commercial fisherman um, and wants to put it in the chat, you're more than welcome to. I actually, I've lifted them, but I don't actually know how much they weigh. <laughs> nice. Um, some other questions that we're getting are, um, are Humboldt squid becoming a problem? But so uh, not, not so much Humboldt. In fact, um, as far as I know from talking to commercial fishermen, we haven't seen them um, in any sort of numbers this year. We see the market squid. And so that's a different species. Um, they're much smaller um, and they come up, they follow. So uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying all fish live within their comfort zone um, or invertebrates too. So I shouldn't just say fish, but Marine species live within their comfort zone. They don't recognize international borders or state borders or regional borders. They live within their comfort zone. So when temperatures change or um, pH changes or oxygen levels change, the species move to where they're comfortable. And sometimes that's deeper and sometimes that's north and sometimes that's offshore and sometimes it's inshore. And so when we have warm water, we tend to see market squid moving up from California into our waters because it's the temperatures that they want to be in. <laughs> Same thing with albacore. People call me up and they say, when's albacore going to be here? And I say, I don't know. It could be late June. It could be late July because they come when the water temperature is the right temperature for them to be. Um, and so with a lot of marine species, um, it's all a matter of, you know, what the ocean's doing and what those species kind of prefer. Um, and so we do get humbled sometimes. As far as I know, we haven't had a, a, any sort of large numbers of them this year. Um, we are seeing maybe some species that might become more common like market squid, other species that might become less common such as halibut as the ocean conditions change. So it'll be interesting to see how some of these things play out. So speaking a little bit about that, um, how many pounds of market squid have been caught this year? I haven't checked recently. Uh, last time I checked, like well, I could look on ODFW, I could cheat real quick. <laughs> um, so I will say this, we have a threshold in Oregon where if a certain amount is caught, we have to have meetings to discuss how we might manage market squid. Because as I mentioned, we don't actually manage market squid here in Oregon. Um, it's all managed in California. And so we reach a certain threshold, we reach a certain threshold of how much is caught, then we have to have a meeting to talk about management. And we had one of those meetings April. in April. What's the... <laughs> Call a friend. <laughs> yeah. My husband's Googling it for me. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to give out wrong information. And so I think I know the answer, but I'd rather just double check and then I will make sure I give you the right answer. Um, I also typically look at total landings after everything's done and things are still happening right now. And so it's constantly changing. So we still have market squid vessels off in Newport right now. And so that number is constantly changing. So I'll get you the latest and greatest. Um, but typically what I do, it says once they reach four and a half million pounds. Oh yeah, they have to have a meeting when they reach four and a half million pounds, which so I knew that, met, but that was in they, April. They met that, and so now it's... So they, they met that in April. I don't know what we're up to now because it's not necessarily reported that way. Usually we get like kind of a year-end year report. Um, so I could do some Googling and tell you what we're up to, but I don't know offhand. I've got some hagfish questions for you. Um, are hagfish a sustainable fishery? So the answer is we think so, but we don't know. We know very little about hagfish. We know they're weird. We know they live in weird conditions. They live in parts of the ocean that nothing else lives in. They like weird hypoxic conditions in areas where they all live on top of each other. Um, 
but we don't know very much about them. And in fact, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is going to do a study to try and learn more about hagfish because there's so much we don't know about them right now. Um, but we think so because um, the demand for hagfish is so low that they're, you know, we're not catching that much. Um, and then I had a question here about, um, do you know if the slime of hagfish is used as a skin um, treatment? Uh, it seems like people have heard that possibly you can take a slime bath in South Korea. And they were just curious if you would have the same. So I've spent quite a bit of time in South Korea and that would not surprise me. Um, you can do a lot of things in South Korea. Uh, I don't know what sort of benefits it would have though because it doesn't really stick to you. Um, it, I mean, it is, it's hard to remove, but not necessarily because it's sticky, but because you pull and pull and pull and you keep pulling. Um, people are trying to like use it like um, to test the tensile strength and see, you know, if you can use it some sort of microfiber. People are doing all sorts of things with it. So I wouldn't be surprised if you could take a bath with it. Um, so moving from hagfish a little bit, um, how often are some of these fishing boats reconfigured to fish for a different type of gear in a season or in a year? So, you know, um, the crews work hard and fast and you will sometimes see a vessel that's set up for say Dungeness crab and you go down there three days later and it's set up for ground fish. Um, and so if you've ever had the opportunity to just wander around Newport, basically between Port Dock 7 and Port Dock 5, you'll see all, like stacks of gear and all sorts of things and staging areas. If you ever go to the International Port, um, you have Foulweather Trawl, which is where uh, Sarah and her team makes a lot of this gear and repairs the gear during kind of the off season. Um, and so they can actually reconfigure fairly quickly depending on what they're going, if it's just a matter of adding a net or if it's a matter of, you know, removing something. Um, other things take much longer and, you know, they actually have to install things. Um, uh, some of the larger uh, reels and things like that, they might take off so they can go for one thing and then have to reinstall it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an, there, a lot of these vessels are kind of ever changing. Luckily with, when they're going for crab, most of the time they don't have to take anything off. They take the nets off, anything they don't need to keep the deck clear. Um, but what happens with crab pots is they'll, they'll basically put all the crab pots on the boat, take them out, um, drop them, soak them. Um, and then they leave them there because when they're, when they're collecting crab, they go, they pull up the pot, they dump the pot, and then they put the pot right back in the water. Um, and so, you know, they're not trying to put that on their boat. And so you don't necessarily have to re reconfigure the boat too much in order to do crab. Nice. Um, we are getting close to being out of time, but I wanted to say that we did have, uh, Vaughn answered us about the um, crab pot weight, um, saying that it's somewhere between 60 and 125 pounds, depending on the pot. So they can be heavy. So if you've lifted one, Angie, good for you. Excellent, yeah, perfect. Um, and then the last question that I see active here is, um, are the uh, market squid actually sold here in our local markets or is it all um, shipped other places? It is not. Unfortunately, we um, do count kind of landings here um, by certain metrics just for kind of um, tracking. We don't have anywhere to process it in Oregon. So it might be landed here, but then it gets trucked down to California to get processed. Um, or it might just get uh, shipped down to California to get processed. Usually trucking is better because then the boat can go back out, but it depends on the vessel and if it's ready to go home or stay up here. Um, but the nearest processing facilities are not in Oregon. Uh, they're in California. And so that's usually where it ends up going. Um, and so there are quite a few processing, you know, companies, if you will, uh, talking about whether or not it makes sense to put one in Oregon um, because we've been seeing market squid fairly consistent, consistently over the last several years. So um, I just wanted to end on one uh, more question is, as a community, if there was something we wanted to do to help support our fishing fleet at this time, is there a recommendation you might have for us? Oh, it's almost like I asked you to do that, even though I didn't. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, in fact, I would say eat Oregon seafood. Um, and myself and some of my colleagues that are probably on this call are on part of a big project right now on this exact issue where we are, we've developed a website, eat Oregon seafood. Um, it's an Instagram and Facebook hashtag where we have really, really, really good chefs um, that are preparing dishes with Oregon seafood and providing the recipes and tutorial videos. Um, and we, on, on the webpage, we have um, lists of markets everywhere you can go and buy Oregon seafood. Um, recommendations on how to prepare it if it's frozen, if it's fresh, if it's canned. So yes, eat Oregon seafood.
Wonderful. And I think that is a great way to end our evening together tonight. Um, there are a lot of comments that just say thank you so much. This has been really helpful. Um, it's been educational. They've learned a lot. They're excited to um, eventually do one in person. Um, so just thank you so much for being a part of this and, and sharing with us. What yeah, you're thank you. Feel free to email or call and let me know. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thanks, Cinnamon. You're very welcome. All right, everyone online, hopefully I'll see you in a month uh, on the next Virtual Science on Tap on G July 22nd. Um, until then, oh, I just see that we have some um, information. Somebody just posted the uh, website Perfect. on Thank the you. chat. So if you want to grab that, um, that would be great. And to everybody, have a good night. And um, we'll hopefully see you at some other time in person. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Angie. I appreciate it. All right. Bye, everyone.